this is Kristen. And this is Ashley. And this is a thousand miles of true crime. Hi, everyone. We are so, so happy that we made it to over a thousand plays. Thank you all so much for being supportive and listening to our podcast. Ashley, what are your thoughts on hitting a thousand plays? Oh my God. Thank you so much, you guys. This is a, this is a big deal for us. I mean, we were excited to do this. We figured we could come up with about eight listeners and we were (laughs) still really happy with that. We were like, we're still going to have a great time and we're going to do this. So this is just such an awesome milestone to have already hit on what number episode is this? Is this eight? This is eight. Yeah, we hit it actually before seven. We hit it before the Dyatlov episode even came out. So Thank you so much, you guys. We just appreciate it um, and all the support we've gotten. We hope you guys are enjoying the show. Uh, We know we are, and uh, this is just the beginning. I'm sorry, but if you could just like stop right now, if you have not reviewed us, it's super easy. Like you don't even need to leave us a gushy review. If you could just give us five stars, we'd really appreciate it. I hope you guys are ready for today's case. It's going to be about Sean Ellis, a man that was convicted of murdering John Mulligan. And after serving 22 years in prison for this murder, it turns out he didn't actually kill John Mulligan. This case, I do want to say, made me think so much about how quickly someone's life can change because their one chance encounter with police. It made me think of how messed up our judicial system is. Um, even when they know they have it wrong, it just is like, well, let's fix that. Let's change that. Let's make that wrong. Right. Um, and it further infuriates me on the length of time it takes for wrongs to be made. Right. Sean's case is one of many where there is someone in prison at this very moment for a crime that they did not commit. I'm going to start by talking about Sean's youth Um, He was just a kid who grew up in the housing projects in the Roslindale area of Boston, Massachusetts, uh, raised by a single mom and, you know, took care of his siblings. When Sean was eight, his brother passed away. His brother was 13 years old and he drowned in kind of like a freak accident. He drowned at 13 because he didn't know how to swim. And I mean, around. I don't know how a 13 year old jumps in a pool when they know that they don't know how to swim. It does happen though, that like people think they can swim or, you know what I mean? You think you have a better grasp on what's going on than you do. My friend almost drowned me actually. Did I say that right? Drowned me. But, uh, we were at, so my, like at the end of the year for softball, they would throw like a pizza party at our swimming pool, like Memorial pool. And, we were there and I talked to my friend and I was like, oh, you should go down the slide. And she, she could swim, but she wasn't like the best swimmer. I think we were like eight and nine or something, probably a little older than that. And, um, I was like, just do it. It's a lot of fun. I- I'll jump in. If you're, you know, having any issues, there's lifeguards on duty. I don't know why this was the plan. And so, yeah, my girl's like kind of flailing in there and I'm like, oh my God. And I jump in and this is a packed pool full of kids. Like, cause you could bring your families and all this stuff. And, um, so, so yeah, my dumbass jumps in and tries to save her and she almost drowned me. And the, um, the, cause she's like, you know, you're just trying to survive. So she's doing like everything she can to get above water. And I'm like, like, I can't breathe. So the lifeguard jumps in and saves both of us and then yells at us a lot. And he's like, why? Like he didn't yell at her at all, obviously, but he yelled at me like, why would you try to jump in? And, and I mean, that. think about being a lifeguard and seeing a pool filled with kids. That's probably even harder than a, like an open pool and someone drowning. Cause it's more easily visible to see, okay, they're struggling. Let me jump in and save them. But a crowded pool, I can't imagine what it's like to be a lifeguard. Like the the stress level would be up to here. So his brother died when he was 13. So that had to have created a major change in Sean's life, losing his brother. And it's at this point that his mom, who's raising him and the rest of his siblings, becomes addicted to crack cocaine in 
like coping with the death of her son. He is now basically left to deal with the death of his older brother, his mom being addicted to a a chemical substance. And, you know, he's now the kind of the man of the house. He's responsible for looking after his siblings and kind of taking care of them because his mom is, you know, she has an addiction problem. So his mother's addiction issues didn't just cause the stress like there with raising the kids, but there were other tensions during his childhood. The men that she would like bring around, they weren't the most, you know, the best uh, impressionable men to have around your children. Um, So there was a lot of disdain there that Sean had towards his mom, obviously, um, and how she was coping with the death of his brother. He life still carried on. So he goes through his childhood, like this, this tension that he has towards his mom um, because of her addiction and just how she's behaving, how she's coping, had to like have take a toll on him. But through all that, he still manages to make it through, um, graduate from high school, even considering, you know, coming from the projects. I think that's like, I'm sorry. Let's just take a moment. That's very impressive. Like that's very hard for your family to go through to like, lose a son is, or like, you lose a child in general is just horrible. And then just w- having like an addicted mother is that makes your entire life challenging. So I'm just very, I'm proud of him. That's an awesome accomplishment. It totally is. He overcame a lot. I would have to say by making it to that milestone But unfortunately, after high school, you know, he really struggled to find work. He's he's in the projects and, you know, he's trying to pull himself out of that. But he finds himself around the wrong crowd. He's got kind of like a posse. They're they're not necessarily a true gang, but, you know, he, he bands together with this group of other guys and they just pretty much kind of cover each other's back. So like where they're living is what kind of exposed him to this other life. He was then kind of introduced to selling drugs to make a living because he couldn't find work any other way. Well, any but, kind of work he would have found was not going to pay what he'd be able to make dealing drugs most likely. Right. I mean, but he was making the effort still like he didn't want to just be a drug dealer. He, you know, he wanted to, to be something. I mean, it was just hard for him. He had a speech impediment, a uh, really heavy stutter, and he was black. And but I'm sure he's having to help take care of his family. It's not like all the money he makes, he can go out and buy shoes or what. You know what I mean? That's not the situation, most likely. So, and it's you know, it's it's exactly what you said. It's that too. You know, he's looking after his siblings because his mom at that point is really heavy and deep into her addiction. So. Not only is he trying to make a living the best the best way that he knows how, but he's also still got to look after home because mom's not really actively around. He never really got into any like major trouble. The only trouble that he ever really had been in was um, because of an incident where his younger sister was at home with him and his mom and her boyfriend kind of got into like this argument or altercation. And so he took her out of the house. And like, just took her like for a walk around the block to just not be present for whatever was going on at home. And his mom, you know, she was just messed up and she called the police on him and he was actually arrested for kidnapping. It's messed up and it's, it's sad that his mom would have called the police on him, (laughs) but um, those charges were actually later dropped. So like nothing ever came of that, of those charges. And then the few other instances were just like from, uh, you know, common altercations with his mom or, you know, one of his mom's boyfriends that she had in her life at that time. So now it's at this point in his life, he's 19 years old. He's trying to figure life out like most 19 year olds are doing at that point. And it's on September the 26th of 1993 that Sean's life changes forever. Sean was actually over at his cousin's house and it's around like 3 a.m. in the morning. Sean is asked to go to Walgreens to grab diapers because one of his cousin's babies needed diapers. It's 3 a.m. I don't know if like that's the best time to go to Walgreens um, in this area, but this is where they live. So, hey, we're going to buy diapers. 
So he doesn't have a car. And instead, he goes outside and he sees a friend named Terry Patterson. And he's like, hey, can you take me to Walgreens to get these diapers? And Terry's like, sure. So they go to Walgreens. He buys the diapers. And he accounts going back to his cousin's house. It's at this same time that Sean is at the Walgreens that a murder takes place. But not just any murder. This is the murder of a Boston police detective. His name is John Mulligan. And John was at Walgreens. He was actually doing a security detail shift at this very time. So when I think of someone doing a security detail, I think, you know, they're going to be looking around, watching, seeing, you know, what type of people are around the Walgreens, making sure there's no one stealing, making sure there's no suspicious activity. But John Mulligan was actually sleeping in his car with the window partially cracked. And someone walks up to the car and murders him execution style by shooting him five times in the face. So I say walked up to the car, but we don't really know if that is true. There was no cameras even in this area? There were cameras, but this is 1993. So I don't know. I don't know the details behind that. But as I get deeper into this, it really, that the whole camera thing really makes me wonder. That's um, so personal. Five shots. Five so shots. Insane. That's that's Cop. intent. Someone was intent on this guy being dead. It was intentional. So also the, the person that murdered John also took his gun. So I'm just going to say this because this is really being at the wrong place at the wrong time. That's a real thing. So do you, how do you feel about police corruption? Do you think it's a thing or like, what are your thoughts on police corruption? Um, Yeah. I mean, I've personally seen some things like, I definitely think that, yeah, I think we need to look at the. Yeah. So police corruption, I believe, I agree is a real thing. Um, I'm not saying all police are bad. I'm not saying I'm anti-police. What I am saying though, is that, you know, it's, At this point, the Boston PD is under scrutiny for their lack of proper investigation. And they're notorious and known for falsifying warrants. They're known for paying off drug dealers, prostitutes for their silence or for their testimony. Like, I I just think about how crazy situations get when a police officer is murdered And considering that John Mulligan was murdered execution style, the detectives in Boston were all over this. I will add that John Mulligan did not have the best track record of being an honest police officer. He had a reputation of robbing drug dealers, prostitutes, um, or he would threaten them with like, I'm going to arrest you or I'm going to pin this on you. And he would just be like blatant about it. Um, He had a high arrest record. They actually called him in plain sight because anytime that he would bring, bring someone in or he would have an arrest, like, you know, for drugs or whatever, it would be like, oh, the drugs were in plain sight. So he's just like throwing a bag down? Pretty much. And I've, I've seen officers do that. So I do know that that's an actual thing. John wasn't alone in his little corrupt behaviors. He also had a group of other Boston police officers in his little tribe. And those officers are Walter Robinson, John Brazel, and Kenneth Acera. All of these officers were known to like falsify warrants for drug dealers and prostitutes. Um, They would rob them, steal their drugs and their money, not turn it in, keep it for themselves, or put it back on the street. They were known for paying informants off for false testimony, having sex with prostitutes and minors at this time. So all of these officers were, we'll just call them dirty. Having the reputation and like being known on the streets in this area is just, 
you're known for, for robbing drug dealers and doing all this stuff. These officers probably had a target on their back, all of them, right? But when I think about corruption and like this little ring that they had, I also think about well, what else was going on in this ring? Like, was there any animosity or was there any, you know, drama going on inside with these four officers? Did one want to take the other out? Because that's that's corruption for you. You know what I'm saying? Could they yeah. have had, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 I was going to ask you. So, because you, cause you said you had kind of alluded to, you know, there's a chance that even one of them took one of them out. So is there a chance like, he was skimming off the top or was it, was it something like that? Oh, it's, it gets so tangled up and it it's like so many things were wrong. It, it really makes me wonder, could those other three officers actually have had something to do with John Mulligan's murder themselves or maybe even another cop, you know, because this wasn't a secret. John Mulligan's behavior was known to all of Boston PD. Other police officers were, you know, stating that he had a bad rap and everybody on the police force knew it. That makes it even more infuriating that all this was happening and and people knew about it and nothing was being done about it. It's never a good sign either when someone gets murdered and you're like, well, here's the list of 80 people that possibly could have done it. And you would think that that would have been the case, especially in this situation, because I'll say the Boston PD itself, they were already in the doghouse for like improper investigations, but they were stating this list could be very long. You know, he had falsely convicted a bunch of people. So, so, I mean, the list, they knew the list would have had to have been long, especially because the style in which he was murdered, execution style, like. It's it's clear someone wanted him dead. They didn't take his wallet. They took his gun. There, there was some anger behind this murder. And it just proves even more so that these officers in the Boston Police Department at this time were totally using their power as a tool to manipulate people. And, and that's that's really messed up. So John Mulligan's murdered a massive task force is created to investigate his murder. Like there's like 50 uh, investigators, detectives, whatever you want to call it, that are assigned to his case. They want to find out who this is. But a number of suspicious things happened when John Mulligan's body was, was found and the police arrived and everything after the call was made into the police by the Walgreens employee. Cause that's, that's who called it in. They were like, the guy is sitting in front of Walgreens. He's slumped over and he has visible gunshot wounds to his head. So the police arrive at the Walgreens. And for, from my knowledge of like when a murder has happened, John Mulligan's body was transported via ambulance. In the ca- other cases that I've researched, even in, you know, the cases that are like personal to me that I've been there when someone has died, the body should not be transported by an ambulance. It should actually be transported by the coroner. That's one red flag. And that, that's protocol. Another, I guess, kind of red flag was when the murder was reported to the public that John Mulligan, you know, was murdered execution style. The police commissioner at the time, he stated this murder was a cold-blooded, premeditated murder based on the nature of how he had been killed. And that, you know, the only thing that was taken from the vehicle was his gun. Already, it's been released to the public. This is premeditated. This is, you know, intent. I remember how I said that his car window was cracked and he was asleep in the car. It was not wide enough for someone to, I guess, finagle their arm in through the window. How could someone from outside of the car have gotten, one, gotten their hand through the window, 
and position it in a way to shoot John Mulligan in the face five times. Like the ballistics and all the, the stuff that they did, they're like, the, the angles are not making sense. Like, it's, is, is it possible that someone was in the car and murdered John Mulligan? Well, it seems like even if you open the door to shoot him, you wouldn't then like go on an angle and try to like shoot him from the front, right? Because is that what you're saying is like the bullets are through the front of his head? Right. It just, it wasn't making sense. There were witnesses actually that provided statements saying John was known to see prostitutes when he was doing his security detail at this Walgreens. And there was actually an account and a report of one of John's gals. She called the police and she reported that John gave her a call that night or morning, whatever, and was like, hey, can you come down to the Walgreens and give me a little love, whatever. And she was like, hey, I'm tied up, but I'm going to send down one of my girls. And she sends down another girl. Well, that's reported. To the police, but that's kind of brushed to the side, right? Well, and that that's like the only thing that would make sense for that angle. Like I was really trying to figure out, like, why would someone be in the car in, in front of him? Like, and then you're saying that I'm like, oh yeah, no, I can think of a few reasons. Then there's another witness that comes forth, and she says she saw a woman in Mulligan's car around the time of the murder too. And she said that the woman that was in the car with him was a white female. Okay, so that's one witness. That's two witnesses. Okay, so another witness reports saying that, and this witness is actually a a Boston police officer too. He reports that another officer that's black was upset and bothered by what like Mulligan was doing. Um, that he was just being a shitty cop. Um, and he was especially mad because he was sleeping with these young black girls. And even if they were prostitutes or not, like he was really, really bothered by this. The black officer told this other officer that he was going to shoot Mulligan between the eyes. So he, he stated that specifically. And this officer then went and told, you know, hey, <laughs> I heard this from this other officer, but I don't know if there's any truth to it. If that cop didn't do it and he said that, you know, he was like, oh, I really wish I didn't say that. (laughs) Well, I I think more than anything, he was probably like, good riddance. Yeah. So suspects, right? We would think that there is this super long list, right? But there is not. Mulligan's girlfriend was, was brought in, you know, as a suspect initially because of the witness that said, oh, this white woman I saw in the car with him. Um, But she was immediately cleared. So how did Sean Ellis get wrapped into this mess? Three days after John Mulligan was murdered, two of Sean's cousins were murdered. Okay. The, The cousins that he went to get the diapers for. So as his cousin's murders were being investigated, you know, police are all over that area. So as they're investigating Sean's cousin's murder and he's on scene, you know, he's trying to see what's going on, like what happened to his cousins. Sean is eventually brought in to be interviewed. And it's in that interview that he places himself at that Walgreens where he was buying diapers at three in the morning. And that just so happened to be around the same time that John Mulligan was murdered. So it was like, you're here, you've placed yourself in this crime or in this, you know, vicinity of where this murder happened. So let's see what else we can get from this 19 year old kid. And they were, they were hard on him in interviewing him because the other person that he was with, the guy, Terry, that drove him to the Walgreens, he too was brought in for interview and grilled. And, you know, Terry didn't actually accuse Sean of murdering Mulligan, but the police asked the question, did Sean murder John Mulligan? And Terry is there. His attorney is there. 
And the police officer claims that Terry nodded his head, yes, that Sean murdered John Mulligan. Terry's attorney is physically there. And, you know, they're like, no, my client did not nod. My, you know, that did not just happen. We are not about to go down that road. But because that happened, everything just took off from there. So now both of these guys are in the ringer. Terry being the person that drove Sean to the Walgreens that morning and Sean being there and these like ghost witnesses that came about and said that they saw Sean and Terry near Mulligan's car, like squatted down near it um, or near the pay phone that was right by it. Now things are coming full circle. All of a sudden, this cold-blooded, premeditated murder that the police com- commissioner originally said, this was an intentional crime. You know, someone was out to get John Mulligan. We're going to find out who it is. Now it's switched up. And now it's a crime of opportunity that these two young kids murdered John Mulligan for his gun. That seems to be a major a escalation. Yeah. Like I just say like, Where's his, you know, his background in, in this? That would be like quite an escalation. And then I just, I, I, I'm i like, did the investigators just like skim over all the other, other information that they had and all the other leads that they had to just pursue these two guys? And that is what doesn't make sense to me. All of those other witnesses made the cops look bad, you know? Like if he got caught with a prostitute, that doesn't make the Boston cops look good. If, if another cop shot him, that doesn't make the cops look good. Like, it seems like none of these, now this story works like this, this, the, the media can grab onto. And that's exactly what they did. And you would think just because like, it's your, you know, it's like your cop. It's, you know what I mean? It's this like brotherhood that they would be doing anything in the world to not tamper with evidence and like, make sure they get the right guy kind of thing. But yeah, it seems like from the beginning, they were sort of trying to mess up this evidence. Oh yeah. That's, that's what makes me think there was an officer involved in this murder, whether or not it was, you know, one of these other three officers that were in this little corrupt ring with Mulligan. I'm not sure, but there's so many other things that happen that I'll talk about that is like, how, how can you not see this? I do want to talk a little bit more about examples of corrupt incidents against people of color by the Boston PD just before this incident happened, just so that you have um, some history on what Boston PD was doing at this time. In 1989, this, this was like a big deal. There was this guy named Charles Stewart, and he calls into 911 making the uh, claim that he was just shot and his wife was just shot by a black man. And they're like in their car, his wife, her name is Carol. She's pregnant. The police get there. Carol is pronounced dead. Their unborn child is pronounced dead. Charles is rushed to the hospital. Like, Hey, we're trying to save this guy. The 911 call is like, supposedly, you know, that, that was like a, a big deal at the time, like, oh my gosh, you know, this 911 call is crazy. The dispatcher's trying to keep Charles on the phone, keep him from blacking out or whatever from his gunshot wound. Turns out Charles was trying to l- run a little insurance scam and have his mur- his wife murdered so that he could collect on some insurance money. And so he didn't have to have that baby. I mean, Boston PD, they get the word that a black man has shot these two people. Charles is at the hospital and like the, the surgeon or the doctor that was working on him was like, there is no way possible that this guy um, could have shot himself. Like he's about to die. So they're like, go find this black guy, go find this black man that shot these two people. Turns out Charles's own brother tricked off on him. Charles's own brother knew about the details that his brother was wanting to kill his wife for insurance money, and he had a conscience. He spilled the beans. So before he was able to spill the beans, 
Boston PD terrorized Black men in Boston. You know, they were looking for anybody to pin this on. And even if it wasn't the right guy, they just were like, we got to nail somebody for this. So it was a big deal and it was really frowned upon. And this made the scrutiny or like, you know, the microscope that Boston PD was under at the time even more prevalent because they're they're out here just terrorizing and being extremely aggressive with these black people all because they're they think that this is these are the people that shot Charles and Carol. And so when Charles's brother comes out and says, my brother did this. You know, like I can't hold it in. But at that point, Charles is already out of the hospital. He's trying to flee. And once he realizes, hey, I'm not going to be able to get away with this. I'm not going to be able to escape going to prison for murdering my wife for insurance money. So he ends up taking his own life by jumping off of a bridge. I can't believe that just because Charles Stewart said a black man did this, that Boston PD were like, all right, we're not going to investigate any further. We're just going to take what this guy says, all because the surgeon or the um, the doctor that was working on him at the hospital was like, yeah, he couldn't have inflicted this wound on himself. But indeed, he actually did. You, It really makes you see how easy it is to have to just pin the murder of his wife and his unborn child on a black man, all because um, he knew it would have been an easy sell. He knew he could possibly get away with it. It's sad and it's infuriating all at the same time. The police well, it sounds like I mean the police didn't solve this, right? Like if his brother didn't turn him in, they'd still be looking for this black guy. The police have their suspects. They've got Sean and they've got Terry. And they're, you know, really Sean is proclaiming his innocence from the beginning. He's like, I didn't do this. Like, I have nothing to do with this. I just so happen to be here. And Terry is is claiming the same thing, but they're already now being tried by the media. They've got Terry, a witness saying that they saw Terry's car driving erratically and suspiciously in the area at the time of the murder. And so it's like, they're all over the newspaper. They're all over the news that they're the guys that did this. This is before a trial or anything. This is, these are the guys we think did it. So that's who, that's who you're seeing. The media never wants to show black victims, but they're certainly fine with showing black murderers, alleged black suspects. There we go. And and we know that trial by media is a real thing. Like we've seen it completely. Yeah. So Terry Patterson, um, he's interrogated by Detective Brazel. Uh, one of the dirty cops in this little tribe. And these are not homicide investigators. These are drug, like narc detectives. They're, they're not, they sh- like, why are they even working a homicide case? So being at the wrong place at the wrong time, Brazel fabricating that Terry confirmed, Sean pulled the trigger. Um, both Sean and Terry are arrested for John Mulligan's murder. The whole trial by media thing happens. I always ask myself, like, why would Terry have fingered his friend? And then I remember watching some horrifying police interrogations. And I would say fear, being young, coercion, um, not wanting to be convicted himself because I'm sure that they were making threats to him um, or telling him, you know, if you say that Sean did it, you know, we'll give you immunity or we'll take some time off of your sentence or whatever the case may be. But neither one of them are in a good place. So both end up getting sentenced to life. All right. So imagine being 18 and 19 years old and your life flashes before your face. You're about to go to prison for the rest of your natural life. I want to talk about a specific witness in particular, that seemed to really help the prosecution's case. She was their key witness and seemed to really seal the fate of this case in Sean and Terry being the people that murdered John Mulligan. Her name is Rosa Sanchez. I'd say this was a conflict of interest because Rosa Sanchez is actually 
affiliated with a Sarah, one of the corrupt cops. Okay. And so not like, you know, from a distance, but very close. Rosa Sanchez, her aunt is actually dating a Sarah. A Sarah actually pulls Rosa into the investigation. So she didn't call before or anything. You know, he pulls her in and actually brings her down to the precinct and is like, let's, let's, let's pin this on these two guys. Um, so she's brought in because she says that she saw Sean crouched near Mulligan's truck or Mulligan's car this evening of the murder. They do the lineup. And so they bring in potential suspects. She fingers the wrong guy. Hmm. Not one time, twice. So after this, I guess the Sarah's frustrated and is like, yo, come on. Like, all you have to do is pick out this one black person. Like, how hard can that really be? So he takes her down to his car outside of the police station and then says, okay, Rose is ready to go. Pulls her back in. And now she correctly identifies Sean Ellis from the lineup. On her third try. Yeah. So that in itself should have, in my opinion, that should have been not allowed at all. Just her direct affiliation with the Sarah. But she was she was the prosecution's prime witness. And that to me, that is just mind blowing. Like they knew that. And there were multiple trials that Sean actually went through and To this day, Rosa still says that Sarah didn't, you know, um, coerce her into saying that Sean was was present or anything like that. But come on. I mean, let's be real. Knowing how corrupt these officers were and her direct affiliation. I mean, it, it can't get any. There's no more red flags needed. The gun that was supposedly stolen from Mulligan's car was found. And this is found near the area of where Sean's cousins were murdered. But it, you know, it was after the fact. It was after the fact. Sean's uncle Dave that had just gotten out of prison, these police were basically playing on him. They were like, hey, do you know anything about this murder? You know, if you can, you know, tell us where these guns are, tell us your nephew's affiliation with this murder. And if, and if you don't tell us what we want to hear, then we're going to pin something on you. We're going to throw you back in the slammer. So they're basically in, intimidating his uncle, Dave. You know, he's been in prison for 14 years and he doesn't want to go back. His uncle states that he asked Sean, did you have anything to do with this murder? You know, you can tell me. And Sean was like, no, no, no. And then he tells He says that Sean tells him that Terry shot him and threw the guns on him and was like, you know, get rid of these for me. You're my friend. Hide these guns for me. The gun that murdered Mulligan and the gun that was stolen from Mulligan. David, his uncle Dave is making these accounts to the police because they're telling him that that's what they want to hear. But later he basically recants that, you know, my nephew had nothing to do with this. That that was like a game changer, basically, in in the trial, the third trial where Sean was actually convicted. Sean is in the fight of his life to get out. He has tried to fight his conviction three times. He has three trials in one year. In 1995, I can't imagine what kind of year that was for him. His first two trials actually ended up in hung juries. And the third is the one where he was actually convicted. So in 1998, a motion for a new trial was requested um, with the details of like all these corrupt officers and corrupt investigators involved in Mulligan's investigation. um, The witnesses being, you know, really shady. And then to like, the consideration that these cops could have even potentially been involved with the murder themselves. And in 99, because the judge didn't feel the defense did enough to prove that these corrupt cops were dishonest on this case, they were like, you know, your motion is denied. So then another appeal is made in 2000 and that too is also denied. 
Terry Patterson, the other guy that was convicted, his conviction was overturned because of police perjury. So he's released in like 2006. Apparently the fingerprints that, you know, they claimed were on Mulligan's vehicle that were Terry's, it was no longer uh, allowed in evidence. Um, And so after that, like, their case basically fell apart against Terry. And instead of them saying, okay, let's review the entire case, they just said, okay, Terry, we're going to give you an out. But before we give you that out, we want you to say that Sean murdered Mulligan. You know, we're giving you a guilty plea for manslaughter, and in return, you'll get time served. So he was basically signing off that Sean pulled the trigger. So it's now like, first, I already got you in this mess by quote unquote nodding uh, when I really didn't nod. And now here I am again, pulling the trigger saying, signing off that you pulled the trigger to get my own self out of jail. And I think desperation will make you do a lot of things. I know jail isn't a pleasant place, even especially when you're innocent. Terry wanted out though. So like he signed the statement and he was released in 2006 and now Sean is left all on his own. He's still, still proclaiming his innocence, um, doing his best to survive, but he's also taking action to try and get out of the situation that he's in. He decides to reach out to uh, criminal defense attorney, Rosemary Scapiccio. And he's like, you know, I know you helped this other guy who was wrongly convicted and you were able to get him out you know, I'm hoping you can take a look at my case and and help me get out of the situation that I'm in. Um, and she did, you know, she had her work cut out for her and time really was not on her side. It was super political because there were like elected officials that wanted no part of what was going on. They wanted no part of the corruption that John Mulligan and the Boston police were doing. You know, they were trying to kind of get the under wraps. There were cover-ups of, you know, actual other people making direct statements about being involved in the murder that were never fully investigated. Officers were committing perjury and there were undisclosed witnesses and accounts of other potential suspects that Boston investigators never, you know, looked into. They just said, oh, well, we've got our guys, so we're moving on. We're moving past this. Um, And a lot of just unreported evidence that was withheld, but not only withheld from the public, it was withheld from the entire defense. So all this stuff as this new attorney, Rosemary, gets on the case, gets uncovered. It took years for that evidence to become accessible to them. Like years, like 10 years. So 10 years, Sean's sitting in jail while she's trying to uncover all this stuff. But I'm so happy that Rosemary fought the good fight and she did the work because on May 5th of 2015, Sean's conviction was actually overturned. And on June 3rd of 2015, Sean was actually released on bail. Boston PD is not feeling this at all. They're, you know, feeling the heat like, we, you know, we had this guy we thought and now he's out. And this this attorney, she's already freed some other suspect. So she's really like, she's on this. She's, she's not giving us any slack here. Boston PD is under a lot of pressure. Prosecutors are under a lot of pressure to convict or try and reconvict Sean. So the prosecutors decide they'll see if Sean will accept a plea deal like Terry did. Like, okay, we're going to give you your time served, but at least this conviction will stick. But Sean was like, I don't think so. I'm not signing anything because I didn't kill anybody. I think the police were hoping that Sean was desperate enough to take a for sure thing to avoid going back to prison. But Sean, like I said, he's like, I am proclaiming my innocence. He refused the deal, even not knowing like what the outcome of the fourth trial was going to be. And good thing that he did because on December the 18th of 2018, all charges against Sean are dropped. Even though in their, you know, press conference, um, when they like came out and said, you know, we're, we're going to go ahead and drop the, the charges against Sean, 
Um, they didn't actually exonerate him. Like they were really crummy with how they came out with it. They were like, you know, you know, we don't have the resources and um, like they, they couldn't formulate evidence at this point. And so much time had passed. Um, but it was just like, well, just clear my name. Just say, you know, I'm not guilty of this. They, I think the prosecution, um, the DA, they just realized this case was messed up from the beginning um, and that they knew they didn't have a chance at winning the case. So all charges in 2021 were actually dropped because there were still lingering gun charges, but everything was dropped in 2021. Was Mulligan like trying to get out of the trio fiasco or, you know, like what, what was really going on? I would love to know the, the nitty gritty behind that. Um, you know, was Mulligan going to trick off on somebody? Um, for, I wonder for if he was just getting too wild too. If like, they were like, we can't control him. He's going to get us all busted. Oh yeah. I mean, did he ever get to sue the police department? So that's probably still to come. Um, he probably will have the opportunity to do that. Um, but I think at this point he just wants his freedom. He's been behind bars for 22 years. And unfortunately, I don't think we'll ever know the truth of what happened to John Mulligan. Well, it sounds like, yeah, they're not reopening the case. No, it's, it's, it's a done deal. Yeah. So if you guys get a chance, check out, um, trial four on Netflix, um, there's also um, a whole site dedicated to, you know, justice for Sean Ellis. There's tons of information out there for it. And that brings it to a close for me tonight. Thank you guys for listening. Yes. Thanks everyone. And thank you, Kristen, for going over this case with us. Please continue to support, rate us, give us all five stars and keep listening guys. We appreciate you.